back up and instead of delving right into the passage, let's make sure that we're understanding the big picture of Galatians, all right? So, so if you have studied the Bible, if you've studied the New Testament in particular, it presents human beings with uh, several problems. We've, it says all have what? Sin. Sin. Okay, but it's it's even deeper than that. Um, the New Testament describes believers as a, or uh, describes human beings, every human being, as having a natural disposition uh, called a sin nature, which leads us away from God. It leads us to selfishness. It leads us to self focus. It leads us to um, what Romans calls suppressing the truth, like we. We don't even want to let the truth come into our heads sometimes because if we know the truth, it often interferes with like how we're thinking, how we're living, all right? So the, the Bible says that's, that's part of our problem. We've got us. We've got us wherever we go. But the Bible also describes that we live in a world that is constantly developing different ways of thinking that go against God's way of thinking. So depending on where you live and when you live, um, these systems of thought will be different, but they will be in different ways opposed to God. So we've got our own internal mess. We've got these outside um, influences and truths being taught. And then the Bible also teaches that there is a real legitimate being called Satan or the devil, a, a fallen angel, a, a rebellious um, demonic force that wants to turn us away from God as well. So we've got, we've got all of this going on, and the Bible says, the, what, what is the solution to that? The solution to that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the one and only Son of God, um, that God the Son, second person of the Trinity, took on flesh, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, and when we place our faith in his work alone for our salvation, we are moved from that old way of thinking, from that old sin nature. The Bible says we're actually given spiritual life. Um, it uses different terms. It, it talks about being born again. It, it talks about moving from death to life. It talks about being blind, but now we can see. All these metaphors, all these comparisons, because... What you're doing is, in a sense, you're leaving the old behind and you're moving into a new way of thinking, into a new way of doing things. That has happened to the Galatians that we're reading about. At least, at least they claim that that has happened to them. They have left the old way of thinking behind. They have embraced the gospel. They have turned to Jesus for salvation. They've been moved from death to life, but... They've now got these teachers coming in and tempting them to go back to what? The law. Uh, specifically the law, but we, if, if we want to broaden it out a little bit to make it a little more relevant to us, they are, they are being tempted to go back to their old way of thinking. They're tempted to go, and, and the same thing happens to every one of us, which is why this book is really relevant. If you have trusted Christ as Savior, you have made a, a revolutionary leap from an old way of living and feeling and thinking into a new way of life, but um, if you haven't you know, experienced it, you will. There are going to be constant temptations to go back to an old way of doing things, to, a, to an old way of thinking, because we have formed really, really bad habits. Okay, with our, with our thinking, with our emotions, with our actions. And so even if you're reading through this book and you're saying, well, I'm not really tempted to think like the Galatians were thinking. Maybe, maybe the system of thought they were turning back to is different from what you're tempted to turn back to. But every one of us is tempted to lose the focus on Jesus, to lose the focus on the gospel and to go back to an old way of thinking. So that's one of the major issues of this book is stick with the gospel, stick with Jesus, keep moving in that new direction that he's given. A second issue that, that keeps coming up and we're starting to head to the part of the book where this is going to become very, very important is the idea of how are we supposed to live? The idea of holiness, the idea that God does have certain rules, certain ways of looking at the world 
that he wants us to live out. And so we come into Galatians, and it's constantly talking about the law. It's constantly talking about God's way of doing things. And so we need to have a, a proper, balanced perspective about God's perspective. The rules, the standards, none of that can save us. None of that can make us right. All as it does is it points out to us how far we fall what? Short, right? Just uh, um, often, <laughs> Paul talks about this in another place in the Bible. He says, you know, if, if uh, he must have had a struggle with coveting in his life. You know, one of the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not covet. And he talks about this. He says, you know, I read the rule or I read the law of God that says thou shalt not covet. And what do we often want to do? Now suddenly we, we think about coveting. Like it, uh, how, if, if I used to be a substitute teacher, I actually used to be a teacher. I used to be a principal. I used to spend a lot of time in classrooms with kids. And you know, one of the great phenomenons of teaching is sometimes kids don't think about doing something until you tell them not to. And then they're like, oh, huh, that's one I hadn't thought of. Let me try that one too. And, and God says we're like that in a certain, a certain extent. So the law can't save us. God's standards can't save us. All they do is they point out to us our sin to drive us to the Savior who can save us. But the point Paul's making then is that doesn't mean that God does, doesn't care about how we live. He cares about how we live, but he cares about us trying to live differently in his power, not our own. It's not picking yourselves up, as the saying goes, by your own spiritual bootstraps and pulling yourself up. It's looking to Jesus, who is the perfect standard in every area of life, but also the perfect empowerer of us to live differently. Okay? So that's sort of the bigger picture of Galatians. And so Paul is defending his leadership. He's defending a lot of different things because he wants to defend the gospel. He wants to make sure that they're sticking with the proper perspective, that your own works, your own standards of holiness, none of that can make you right with God. It is only God who can make us right with himself through Jesus Christ. And it is only God who can then give us the power to move in a new direction. That's the basis of Galatians. Questions or thoughts on where we've been with this book before we move into a new section? All right, then one, just one other quick review thing that we're gonna need to understand, again, this passage. Um, Galatians talks a lot about a guy named Abraham. And so we've been getting bits and pieces of Abraham. Last semester, we spent a whole week on Abraham. So Abraham is a guy from way back in the book of what? Genesis. Genesis, okay. Um, Abraham was living during a period of time where people had forgotten the true God, forgotten their connection with God, and he came from a place where everybody was worshiping idols, statues, false gods. And God comes to him directly and says, Abram, later changes his name to Abraham, I'm going to take you to a new place, not even going to tell you where it is. I just want you to leave. I want you to get your people, get your stuff, start out on this journey, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you, you know, children who have children who have children, and through you, I'm going to form a great nation, and all the nations of the world will be blessed in that. And as we've come to Galatians, we've found again and again that what that ultimate fulfillment was is that one of those descendants of Abraham would be Jesus Christ, okay? And he would be the one in whom all the nations of the world are blessed. That'll help us with what we're going to look at today. All right, so let's read starting up with verse 27. Would somebody read verses 27 to 29, just that little section for us? Hmm. They're more awake than last week, but they're not, not in a volunteering mood. All right, I'll read it. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according 
to the promise. So first off, it, it starts talking about a pretty familiar word in the church world, the idea of baptism. Okay, but this is not really a reference to like baptism where you're put into water. This is a reference to an inner baptism, a spiritual baptism. Sometimes the New Testament is talking about baptism as something inside of you. And sometimes it's talking about uh, something that you go through as a believer outside of you. This one's the, the idea of the spiritual process. For those of you who were baptized into Christ, it's the idea of union with Christ, connection with Christ. Um, Paul sometimes uses the word baptism to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in us, moving us from death to life, making us spiritually alive. And so he says, if you've been baptized into Christ, you have been clothed with Christ. So what? Um, think about the idea of clothing, right? We, we wear different things for different situations, different circumstances. Um, so what, okay, I'm thinking about uh, somebody on my son's soccer team who had a bad habit of, he would like take his jersey off he was like the, the kid who ran the most during a soccer game, just all over the field, running nonstop, sweating like crazy. But he would have a bad habit of changing his shirt after the game, and he would throw his stinky, sweaty jersey into his backpack, and guess what he would often forget to do? Wash it. Forget to wash it. And so then he gets to a game like two days later, and he says to himself, self, I did it again. I forgot to wash my jersey, so what did he have to do? He had only one option. He's got to pull it out of the bag, and he's got to stick it on. And may maybe that was to his advantage because none of the other team wanted to get near him. I don't know. All right? But he, he was clothed with clothing that, had, uh, that, that smelled bad, okay, that was not the type of clothing that you want. And this is a picture here of being clothed with Christ which in the New Testament is often used in comparison to being clothed in our own stuff, which is filled with sin. And so the contrast that the Bible's making is, is if we picture clothing as a, reference, a representation of what's going on in our lives, before Christ, we are stinky and sweaty and smelly like the soccer jersey that's been sitting in the backpack for a couple of days, but we've got to keep wearing that because that's all we've got. But then when this inner work occurs and when we're united with Christ, we're baptized into Christ, it's saying now we're clothed with something different. I don't, I don't know what you're wearing, if it's, if it's designer clothes or you get a new soccer jersey or however you want to fill out the illustration. The idea is we are now different. There has been a change and we're to constantly be putting off this dirty stuff and putting on the good stuff, the new clothing, the, 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 the Christ-likeness. And so he's using this. You were baptized into Christ. You have been clothed with Christ. He's writing this during a time period where there were a lot of, um, and this is, you know, it's not like we're, this is completely foreign stuff to us, but he's writing in a time period where whether you were, in Jewish society, Greek society, Roman society, there was very much a system of haves and have-nots. There was a very much a system of who was valued and who was not valued. And one of the dangers that went on with the church was as people would be baptized into Christ, this internal experience would happen. Some of them were Jews, some of them were Gentiles, some of them had held professions that were very, very sinful. Some of them had very inferior positions in society. Some of them were rich and powerful, and they were all being brought together. Guess what they were tempted to do? Judge each other. They were tempted to judge each other. They were tempted to bring the old clothing into the church when the new clothing says you are one in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is not 
here talking so much about what your status in society was like, the Christians at the time had very little power very little control over what status in society looked like, very little ability to just revolutionize in an instant all of these social relationships. But Paul and the other believers were very concerned that within the church, everybody understood that we're all saved the same way. We're also all baptized into Christ the same way. We all have the same responsibilities, the same Savior, the same oneness. And so look at... When he says there's no Jew or Greek, he is saying not that there aren't Jewish people who have cultural stuff that they do a certain way and Greek people that do things a certain way, but he's saying when it comes to salvation, when it comes to value before God, when it comes to being equal in those things that matter eternally and spiritually, there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. Well, what was the false teaching that was going on? The false teaching was you Gentiles got to act like the Jews. You need Jesus and the Old Testament way of doing things. He goes further. There's no slave or free. This was a particular, there's a whole book of the Bible, the book of Philemon, that is written because a slave and a slave owner both become Christians. The slave escapes, and, or, and now it's how do you work all this out? Okay, we don't have time to go into all of that, but, but these were real life issues that were going on in the church, male and female. You, this was a day where a lot of Jew, there was a, a famous Jewish saying of the day, God, thank you that you did not make me a Gentile, a tax collector, or a woman. Okay, it was a very, very um, poor view of uh, by a lot of individuals of the role of women. And so Paul's coming along again. He's saying, no, no, we're all equally valuable to God, all saved in the same way, all one in the same way. And this would eventually have great social implications over time, but there was no power for Christians to impose anything upon society, but there was power to live differently within the church. And that's what Paul was concerned about here. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. All right, this promise way back in the book of Genesis that, that Christ was coming, that the gospel was coming, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And Paul's saying to these people who are being tempted to exclude Gentiles, to go back to a Jewish way of thinking, no way. God cares about you no matter whether you come from richness or poverty. Uh, comes and cares about you whether you are highly educated or you are the worst student in each of your classes, all right? Cares about you whether you are the most athletic one in here or you can't, as the saying goes, walk and chew gum at the same time, right? There's value and salvation in no other name than Christ, and Paul wants to make sure that that is very clear to those who are listening. So go down to your summary points. When Paul wrote these words, the people around him were valued and prioritized differently. Well, you know, in reality, we could say, as we read these words of Paul, people around us are valued and prioritized differently, right? It's, it's a human problem in all places at all times. In terms of the gospel, all are equally valued and equally need who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, right? If you don't know the answer, say Jesus or the gospel. Either of them <laughs> would fit in the blank here. And then secondly, because of our connection or union with Christ, number two, union, we too receive the blessings or fulfilled promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Because of our connection or union with Christ. Now, I want you to think about inheritance for a second. Uh, we talked about this before, and I asked the questions, how many of you have inherited something, and some of you raised your hands and so forth. But let's say that I go home today, and I find out that I have inherited a billion dollars, and I decide that as a group, instead of just me inheriting it, we're going to inherit it. Everybody happy about that decision? Sure. We're going to have a good time? Right? I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe we'll take quite a vacation. Spring break will be really spring breaky. All right. 
Um, that's not how it usually works. If you inherit something, you might be nice and take me out to dinner, but you're not going to make me an equal owner of your inheritance, right? Not very often. See, what, what the Bible is, in, is teaching and what Galatians is, is teaching by all this use of the idea of inheritance is to get us thinking about what Jesus inherits because of his role and because of the way he lived and died. The Bible says he did not stay dead, but he, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And where does the Bible say that he is right now? The Son of God is at the right hand, right hand of the Father, where he will return one day, and he will be the ruler over a restored, renewed, perfect earth. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, ultimate power, ultimate authority, everything belongs to him. He inherits it all. And see, Galatians is saying, if you have connected yourself to Jesus through faith, he's sharing all of that inheritance with you. Everything that he gets, we get too. That's the idea that is going on here in the background of this book and keeps coming up over and over again. If you're united with him through faith, then we're going to get those blessings. We're going to get that inheritance. We're going to get those promises that he deserves. So if you think even further back, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Sin. Said to the first man and woman, if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Okay. So every human being deserves death physically, spiritually, eternally. The only one who lived as a human being who did not deserve death was Jesus because he never what? Sin. Yep, he never sinned. And so this idea is Jesus ought to inherit blessing. He ought to inherit life. There ought to be no death for him because of his righteous living. And through union with him, God says, I'm going to treat you as if you were Jesus in terms of your righteousness. Now, look, I'll know about you. But I know how I have lived. I know some of the things I have thought. I remember some of the things I have said and I have done. And I know that I am nowhere near Jesus in terms of my righteousness. But see, what the Father does, this idea of being clothed with Christ, it's a picture that now when God looks at us, instead of seeing us in our dirty, stinky soccer uniform, he sees us clothed with Christ. He looks through Christ to see us if we've connected ourselves to Christ through faith. That's, it's a powerful teaching. It means that you can walk around this campus thinking totally different about your life and about your future and about your hope if you have connected yourself to him through faith. He says that you are different and that he sees you differently. All right. On to the next part. Anybody want to read the next part, or you want me just to read it? Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Now, as I say. Now, I say that as long as the heir is a child, he defers it no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because we are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God made you an heir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In that Greek and Roman culture, if you were a well-to-do family and you had servants and slaves and you had children, who was going to inherit your stuff? Was it the servants and slaves? Nah, it was the kids, right? It was, it was especially your oldest son was going to inherit. But there were particular servants in those households who tutored the kids, and there were particular servants in those households 
who were guardians of the kids and these different, you, you can go back and you can read about what this looked like and what their job responsibilities were. But basically, you know, you had, you had some built-in babysitters and you had some built-in tutors who were very hard on you until you reached adulthood. So you're gonna be the boss someday. You're gonna own everything. You're gonna be in charge of the household. But while you're growing up, the people that one day you will give the orders to are being very tough on you. Okay, that's the picture of what's going on here. And then Paul is making a comparison to the difference between living under the Old Testament law and living under the gospel. And he's saying because of your sin, because of the sin of the human race, what did God do? God made some pretty strict rules, some pretty strict laws to show us what we were like and to keep us under control because we were going to make a real mess of things. And even with those rules, we made a real mess of things. But he's saying God was always intending, as he promised clear back at the time of Abraham, that he promised clear back at the time of, of Adam in Genesis chapter 3, that the gospel was coming. And so when we get down to verse 4, when the time came to completion, when God decided that it was the exact right moment in history, God sent his son, the English translators have capitalized that because what the New Testament teaches is that we have an eternal God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. It was not the Father who took on flesh. It was not the Spirit who took on flesh. It was God, the eternal Son, who came away in a manger, no crib for a bed, as a baby, and became the one and only God-man. Unique. Only. One time in history, God sent his son, born of a woman, the woman's name Mary, born under the law. In other words, as Jesus grew up, he had to keep the Old Testament law 100% and perfectly. He had to obey the Ten Commandments perfectly, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. I can keep myself from stealing your car, but I might really want to steal it. Like the inside might say, man, my old hunk of junk that I'm driving around, why does he get that car and I get this junker? Okay, Jesus kept God's law with his attitudes, with his emotions, with his thinking, with his feelings, with every part of him. He kept the law 100% because he was born under that law to redeem those under the law, to, to pay the price for those who had failed to keep the law, which includes each one of us. All right, if we all put our hands up, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In this culture, whether it was a Greek home, whether it was of Roman history, or whether it was a Jewish home, who was the main person in the household who got most of the inheritance? Anybody know? It was the oldest son. All right, and so what does this say here? It says that uh, all of us, if we come to Christ, are being treated like that oldest son. That's the idea here. We're, we're receiving the inheritance that was, was due in that society to the oldest one. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. From the moment that you unite with Christ in faith and you say, you know what? I cannot make myself right with God. I need Christ. The Bible says the Spirit is sent to live within you. And now the Spirit works in you to give you the confidence, to give you the hope, to give you the intimacy with God that you can actually refer to God like Jesus did when he, he taught what we call the Lord's Prayer, our what? Our Father who art in heaven. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. You get all the inheritance of Jesus. So we're almost out of time. We got some blanks to fill in. Number three, all works and rituals were enslaving, leaving most of the world without hope, except for those waiting for the fulfillment of slavery ending promises. There were promises. So 
Works don't do it, but the promises that God made way back at the time of Abraham did. God sent forth, number four, his son at exactly the right time, the right time, the one and only God-man to redeem us and make us his children. And then finally, number five, the spirit within us. The spirit within us is the means and proof of salvation, bringing changes and a new direction like intimacy with God. Intimacy meaning that we can call him father. We can, uh, the, there's an old story like if, if I just decided today that I, I had some solutions that President Biden need to hear about, all right? I've got some ideas, Mr. President, and I tried to go to the White House and get a meeting with the president to give the president my idea what's probably going to happen to me. You'll be turned away. Yeah, well, I'm going to be turned away at the very least, or, or I might be having a nice long session with some, some Secret Service agent who's trying to put cuffs on me because they think I'm a whack job, right? But if I am the president's son and I want to go talk to my dad, He's probably going to find time during the day to see me, right? And that's the idea here is we are now children of God in an intimate relationship with the Father. He'll see us anytime we want. He'll hear us anytime we want. All right, let's pray. Lord, I pray these, these are simple concepts, but yet put into a lot of Old Testament language that sometimes can make it hard for us to understand but maybe walk away today understanding that we're dirty and filthy and we need to be clothed with you, your righteousness, your forgiveness, and that you want us to have that relationship with you through the spirit that is a relationship like children to a father, that we can just talk to you and love you and be loved back by you. Pray that each one in here might experience that. In Jesus' name, amen.